Hello guys, my name is Edward Sereduk and today I welcome you to the second session of the teaching series entitled Saved for Eternity. And if you remember last time we began talking about proofs or evidence of the eternal salvation and we discussed about a free and irrevocable gift, about eternal life's definition, about the Holy Spirit's seal, eternal redemption and eternal inheritance, the imperishable seed of the Word of God, one spirit with the Lord, the last Adam's power, natural life, and spiritual life. And today we're continuing along the same lines. We are in the same big chapter where we talk about evidence of the eternal salvation. And today we'll begin with another proof, another evidence named perfect world versus fallen world. And let's see, Lucifer himself and the first Adam they fell away into sin from a perfect world, in a perfect world and from a position of perfect holiness. Let's remember, like, Lucifer was the shiniest angel in the presence of God. He was in the perfect world, a perfect position of holiness. The same Adam. He was, crea he was created in a world where there was no sin, no sickness, no pain, no poverty, no curses, no anything. He, it, was a, it was perfect holiness. And from that perfection, they fell into sin. Now, even more so in a world full of evil, fallen, full of temptations like today, and of all the appetites and bad habits working against you and me as believers, the probability of you falling from salvation is a million to one unless God keeps you and maintains your salvation intact by the power of the Holy Spirit. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 to 9, that not ourselves, but our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who will sustain us guiltless to the end because God is faithful. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 to 9, and I'll read from the English Standard Version. So that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Then Jude says those who are called are sanctified by God the Father and preserved by him in Jesus Christ. And it says that in Jude 1.1. 1, 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version this time. Jude, a bone servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 23 to 24 conveys the same idea that the God of peace will himself sanctify us and preserve us blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he who called us is faithful, and he is the one who will also do it. Hallelujah. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Finally, Jude says that God is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory. We read that in Jude 1 verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Amen. The next proof is entitled the, the Everlasting Covenant. Let's read a compelling passage from Jeremiah 32 verses 37 to 40 about the new covenant and its effects on the believer. It says this, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. 
for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. In this passage, God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel specifically, but about the new covenant in Christ extended later to the the Gentiles as well. In verse 37, God tells the people of Israel something pertaining only to them as a nation, namely that one day he will gather them out of all countries and bring them back to Jerusalem. But then from verse 38 to verse 40, God begins to tell them things about the new covenant that apply to all believers in Christ today. And how do we know that? First, God promises them they shall be his people. This is a recurring theme in both the Old and New Testaments. God has always been looking for a chosen race and a kingdom of priests that will be his temple to dwell in. And we see in in Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6 a promise to the people of Israel that if they obey the law, they will be that people. Let's read it. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Then in the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, after the crucifixion of Jesus, God tells all people who are in Christ, both Jews and Gentiles, in the present tense, that they are that chosen generation, his own special people, because Christ has fulfilled all the law and conditions. Let's read this passage. But you are, not you will be, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The second proof that the text from Jeremiah applies to the new creation is the promise of God that he will give his people one heart, a new heart, and one way that they may fear him forever. Who is the way, the only way to God? Of course, Jesus Christ. He says this in John 14, verse 6. He says this, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, after we have have established that Jeremiah 32 verses 38 to 40 applies to believers in Christ, let's notice what God says about that new covenant, respectively about salvation. First, in verse 39, God says he will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear him forever. In other words, this new heart guarantees that they, by their own free choice, will fear God forever, not just temporarily. Second, in verse 40, God says he will make with these believers an everlasting covenant. A covenant between two parties ends only when one of the parties dies. We know that God never dies, right? But we also know that believers can never die either since they have eternal life in their new spirits at the time of salvation. Moreover, an everlasting covenant means that covenant will never end. That covenant will never end, suggesting that believers, even by their free choice, will never want to come out of that covenant. And third, in the second part of verse 40, God reiterates that he will put his fear in their hearts so that they, even by their free choice, will not depart from him. Hallelujah. Let's see another evidence of the eternal salvation. The individual deeds versus inherited nature. And this is a little bit of a tricky one, but bear with me. Before Christ came, Why were people condemned to a future hell after physical death? I mean, all people, if 
Christ didn't come to die on the cross, all people that ever lived on this earth, they will go to hell, they will be lost forever after physical death. But why? Was it because of their individual sinful deeds or because, or on the account of Adam's sin that was transmitted to them? Of course, it was because of Adam's sin. Because if Jesus had not come and died on the cross, the good people of the Old Testament, like Abraham, Noah, Elijah, and all the others who have ever manifested faith in God and had good deeds, would have still been condemned to hell despite their good works. Now, in the same way, believers in Christ are saved and go to heaven and remain saved based on the last Adam's righteousness, which is Jesus' righteousness, and not on the account of their good works after salvation. And this is a powerful proof. Another one, the position of the new creation. More, God would not have had any guarantee that his son didn't die in vain or that anyone would make it to the end if he didn't sustain that salvation. Let's try to answer these deeper questions. In what position are you before God today as a Christian, as a born-again believer? There are three possibilities. First, the first one is you are either in Adam's position before the fall in which you can forfeit salvation anytime, like he did, like he went into death by eating from that tree. He was in a position of holiness, but he could forfeit that anytime, and he did. So you are the first possibility is to be in that position where you can forfeit your salvation and lose it. The second possibility is that you are in Jesus' position before the cross, meaning that you have to earn and keep your salvation through the works of the law, through good deeds. That's what Jesus did before the cross, before he went to the cross. Or the third possibility is that you are in Jesus' position after resurrection, in which you can neither, neither fall away back to death, nor have to earn and keep your salvation. And that's the good news. Of course, the third position is a true one. Probably you realize that. And that is the heart of the gospel, the great news, the mystery that God kept hidden for ages. The next evidence is the impossible switch of natures. Question, is it possible for a human being to switch natures at will? I mean, even naturally speaking, human beings can never change their DNA or become sons and daughters of somebody else. It's impossible. Why would that be possible in the spiritual sense, especially since this realm always governs the natural one, knowing that the things in the natural realm are an analogy of the spiritual things? The spiritual realm is superior to the natural realm. So how can it be possible to be an old creation today, a new creation tomorrow, and then after a while, back to an old creation? Of course, it's not possible. And that's what this evidence, this proof, this uh, subsection uh, is all about. The next uh, subchapter is the, the impossible separation from love. And this uh, assurance of salvation comes from Romans 8, verses 38 to 39. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says this. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage states in a very detailed manner that nothing and no one, nor any other created thing, can separate believers from the love of God. However, most Christians again add in their minds that no one can separate them. Yes, it's true, but themselves. And that is not true. The word says, nor any other created thing. Now, are believers, human beings created by God? Are they created? Then they cannot separate themselves from his love either. 
they will never even want to do so at the bottom of their hearts. Plus, this issue is a very critical one. If believers could separate themselves from the love of God, then the word would have mentioned it explicitly, right? Can a natural son or daughter change their DNA to become the son or daughter of someone else? As I previously said, no. Neither can a spiritual son nor daughter change their spiritual divine DNA. Can a natural, normal father or mother ever give up on their son or daughter? No, of course not. Since they cannot do that as created beings in the image of God, even more, God the Father cannot do that. And here I'm talking about normal fathers and mothers because I know there are exceptions. It's a fallen world. But I'm talking about good fathers and mothers. They can never give up on their sons and daughters. Now, are earthly parents better and more loving than God himself who created them according to his image? Of course not. God is much better than his creation, right? Amen. Let's, next, let's also cover the Father's greatness. And John 10 verses 27 to 29 declares that Jesus' sheep will never perish. Let's read it. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither, sh neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Father God is greater, as this verse says, than all, even than believers themselves. However, again, they might add in their minds, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand except themselves. Another evidence is the fear factor. The possibility that salvation expires either by default because we're not careful how we live our lives or by our own free choice introduces a significant dose of constant uncertainty, fear, and anxiety into Christian practice. But the Christian walk should be in rest, according to Matthew 11, verse 28. Fear is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Believers in Christ should not live in any kind of fear. If you as a believer detect in your life any fear of this type, that you might somehow lose your salvation, you must know that fear is not from God. Because we are still exposed to temptation and still do sinful deeds, the repetitive questions of whether our salvation was genuine or whether we have already passed the point of no return are inevitable. They will come to us. The possibility that one way or another salvation will be lost removes certainty and at best gives way only to hope. But the very fact that you want to make sure that you will never give up on Christ shows that your salvation was genuine and eternal. Without the assurance of eternal salvation, there's no real peace. And without peace, there's no joy. And without joy, there is no ability to love other people unconditionally. Consequently, even God does not love us unconditionally if we must maintain our salvation, either directly or indirectly, through our good works continuously. But 1 John 4 verse 18 says that there is no fear in love and that perfect love casts it out because fear involves torment. The one who fears has not been perfected in love. That is, he has not come to be fully convinced of how much God loves him and that that love is without conditions. Moreover, accepting the fear that you might lose your salvation through your choice reveals an unbiblical confidence in your effort in, and good works to keep you in the faith. But God is the one who has anointed you and establishes you in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21. And He's also the one working in you both to will and to do works of salvation for his good pleasure, according to Philippians 2, verse 13. Last but not least, let us ask ourselves the following. Do people, both believers and non-believers, turn against, against God out of pure hatred of him 
as the devil did or because maybe of past traumas in their lives, maybe because of certain frustrations or unfulfilled wrong expectations. Most of the time, if not always, people who seem to be against God and speak ill of Him do so out of frustration or lack of understanding. God knows the heart of man and and doesn't consider those verbal statements when they are not intended. Thank God He ignores them. Now, how can a born-again believer ever come to a place of genuine hatred against God? It is like saying that God or Jesus Christ might one day give up their state of holiness and become sin. And that's impossible. So most such apparent apostasies of Christians come from unfulfilled expectations and not from the fact that they really want to give up on salvation. Let's move forward and talk about another evidence, a powerful evidence, the motivation for living holy. The only reason why believers, especially preachers and pastors, teachers, promote the idea that Christians can lose their salvation is to motivate the children of God to a holy living, more specifically to moral behavior. In other words, live holy or go to hell. However, first, Christians are justified and made righteous at the time of salvation without doing anything good or bad. Second, if true believers could lose their faith, their incentive for sanctification or living a holy life becomes corrupted. The fear of hell becomes the primary mover rather than believers' genuine desire to be holy. A desire springing forth from a regenerated heart as an overflowing response to God's initial love. Fear of hell is not the right godly motivation, and it surely doesn't last for long term. Fear never motivates anyone to do better, but love does. Appreciation does. I have two more proofs, and then I think we'll close this session and uh, this big chapter. And in the next session, we'll move to discuss about objections against eternal salvation. And that one will be even more interesting and fun. So let's see another proof. The good news, double coded, of losing salvation. A fluctuating salvation adds a considerable measure of reluctance to believers regarding evangelism and the lack of appeal in unbelievers toward the gospel. In other words, believers will not want to evangelize such a gospel. And unbelievers will not be attracted to it because it's not such good news. The world and life in general are already full of uncertainties. And a doubtful salvation with the possibility of losing faith is not good news. Neither is it appealing in any way. Do you agree with me? Maybe you don't. I don't know. But it's not appealing. Um, And the last proof is the loss of salvation hypothesis. Now, after we discussed and we presented so many proofs in favor of eternal salvation, Let's suppose for a moment that it's possible for you as a believer in Christ to lose your salvation through sin. Question, how many sins are necessary to make you lose your salvation? The Bible doesn't mention a maximum number of sins that will make you lose your salvation by default. Then once you lose it, I have another question for you. Can you get it back? If yes, that would entail getting baptized in water and with the Holy Spirit again, support for which cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. And if you cannot get salvation back, how do you know when you have crossed the point of no return? Is there such a point, a specific and deciding point? If indeed you can lose your salvation, how come this process is not described in detail anywhere in the Bible? How can you know when you lost it? It's a very logical question. And since this is not a trivial issue, but a matter of life and death, most Christians would like to know, like me, they would like, they would like to know about this, and the Bible should have covered it. But interestingly enough, the Bible doesn't do that. 
The Gospels and the Epistles clearly mention how people can be saved and when is the exact moment when they can know for sure that they are saved. We see that in Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 and we'll read in a minute. However, it doesn't mention anywhere clearly when believers can know that they are fallen away from faith and that they lost their eternal salvation. Let's read Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 where it says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, see how clear, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But nothing like that is in the Bible where it says, if you do this and that, you will not be saved. You will lose your salvation, or you are lost forever. In the following big chapter, uh, this is uh, all I had for the proofs and evidence of eternal salvation. And in the next one, we'll attempt to give biblical answers to the most common objections believers bring against this assurance of salvation. But until we meet next time, I pray that God will bless you and give you answers and give you peace and life in all the areas of your life. Amen.